I have your attention, please. It is a privilege and an honor to introduce the two individuals who will be introducing our keynote speaker. Uh, this was going to be Louis Warren introducing Patty, and Al said he wanted to do it. And that concerned me, so I recruited Al's brother Peter to keep Al in check. <laughs> so I'm not sure if this is going to work, but, uh, but anyway, please join me in welcoming Al and Pete Simpson. And this is being filmed, so watch your damn language. I don't need a tip like that from a whippersnapper like you, I'll tell you. God's sake. Now, here we are gathered together. Peter, I've got to shorten mine all up. This is a rare treat to do this. This is one amazing woman here. Uh, I was privileged to have known her for lo these many years. And, uh, Fortunate to have a person here in great demand. I mean, how you ever made it here is beyond our belief, but I don't want to go into it any further. Uh, and uh, she's a real pro. She's, uh, she's like the old farmer in the field. She's outstanding in her field. Uh, you did get that, Patty. Pete, Peter Hedrick said he pulled one this morning and nobody laughed, but anyway, she's a leader by example and inspiration. I have these notes. Look, that's already almost a fourth done. She has a powerful sense of history and a powerful sense of humor. She is brilliant, provocative, patient to a degree, <laughs> wise, warm, and witty, and she loves people, and they love her, even if they might not agree with her. She is charming and disarming at the same time, but a problem solver, and the glue and the grease that energizes her is a sense of humor and just being a hell of a lot of fun. So, our father taught us that humor is the universal solvent against the abrasive elements of life. She's a doer. Uh, the old phrase, if you damned if you do and damned if you don't, then do. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, she has uh, issues that confound and confuse the West, and she will salve the pain and ease the tension because she believes in listening. It's a sick idea. <laughs> listening, then you learn when you listen. That's a sicker idea. I never learned that. And she has a near holistic, she's near a holistic shaman of compromise and collaboration, something unknown in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and to paraphrase Shakespeare, collaboration, thy name is Limerick. <laughs> and, uh, or Will Rogers, it's great to be great, but it's greater to be human. And a final note, Annie and I love her, and she's a rare gift because she can tell a person to go to hell in the way they look forward to the trip. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm going to shorten mine too, but that's terrific. What's terrific too is the size of this turnout, is the way in which this has been organized and has been conducted thus far, it is the biggest, most stimulating event that I recall, and I'm an old man, uh, in this place. Intellectually sound, absolutely scholarly, and completely captivating. So congratulations to this staff, and Jeremy, and Linda, That's great. and all of you for coming all the way from Scotland and other places. Patty, let me, let me tell you, Al and I, we team taught a course, Simpson Brothers. We taught a course called Wyoming's Political Identity. So we dealt with culture, we dealt with history, we dealt with social forces, but we embellished embarrassingly, and, and we ad-libbed outlandishly. And the only saving grace was to have Patty Limerick come and stabilize us and, and soothe the student's savage breast. And so we owe her so much. We love you with passion there, girl. 
And uh, so here's to the, here's to a, a, not only a stimulating time, but a lady of great confidence and who has inspired more people, taught more students, put forth more of what Western history can be when it's new, when it's modern, when it's continuous, when it's all the things we now are gathered to talk about. So here she comes. Beautifully done. Thank you, Al. <laughs> Well, there's a form of public speaking that is enhanced by having a tremor in your voice. But I don't know what it is exactly. I guess it, if it were my memorial service, that would be right. But then I wouldn't be the one with the tremor in my voice. So that was incredibly kind. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, I do have a handkerchief over there if it's needed again, but I'm okay. Okay, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for letting me be here today and giving me this occasion. Um, I have sentimental memories of my time here. I taught here in the Larum uh, workshops, two-week workshops with deep immersion and really interesting company, and I remember these those vividly and treasure the thoughts of people like Roy Jordan from, oh, no, now I'm going to cry again. I'll go, I'll go there. Uh, people who were in my class, Mick Lehner from Glen Rock. Um, thank you. I'll tell you. You got the Simpsons? You're okay. <laughs> thank you, Ann. Uh, and I have made friends in Wyoming circles since then in ways that are surprising to people uh, who have different expectations. So I had a friend once, I, I had a series on the secretaries of the interior and I brought a bunch of interesting secretaries to Boulder, including Secretary Watt. And that went really well and he had a very good time and I uh, think a friendship came from that. A week or so after Secretary Watt's visit to Boulder, which Boulder, Colorado, which has certain images associated with it, a friend of mine was driving his pickup truck. He's from Boulder, but he has a pickup truck so he can go in disguise if he needs to go places and doesn't want to be recognized as being from Boulder. So he stopped for gas on the way up, uh, up here on I-70, and there was a car with Wyoming plates and Wyoming alumni, University of Wyoming alumni, there. So my friend was chatting with this fellow for that car, and he was talking about some of the troubles that had been happening at the University of Colorado. And then my friend said, you know, there's really some things going on at that university people don't pay attention to and don't know about. My friend said, you uh, probably don't know this, but your fellow alumni, James, James Watt, was just in Boulder and had quite a, he got about that far. And the fellow said, oh, yeah, he said, we all heard about that. And my friend said, oh, you did. You heard that he had a good time. And, and the fellow said, well, actually, you know, what we heard was that he had a good time, and that's because some woman in Boulder has seen the light? <laughs> uh, well, that's not entirely the way I would put it. Uh, but what I would certainly say is that as an historian, if I was going to do a series on the Secretaries of the Interior, then that would be inclusive, and I would uh, enjoy the company of, of everyone who would accept my invitation. And I'm proud to say that one of the things we did a few couple years after that was that we had Stuart Udall and Jim Watt come together and do a program together. And I will also say it as a little bit uh, moment of, I guess it's self-examination, when you were going to the airport to pick up Jim Watt and Stuart Udall, <laughs> you were thinking, whose idea was this? And then, uh, well, actually, it was mine, and it was a wonderful visit. So, okay, so I um, have a speech to give that is not about the heartwarming ties I have in Wyoming alone. So I guess those are on display now. Uh, the premise of this talk is that I am making a case for how, uh, I will say a case that has completely persuaded me, so I hope others might join me in that, or otherwise I'll just hold to it myself. Um, though I think I'm in the right place to get my comrades and allies here. My case is that studying Buffalo Bill Cody is entirely necessary to American self-knowledge, and therefore this conference matters big time. I have used that odd term field guide for this talk. Uh, what I was after here was to use the term field guide to indicate some ways in which the study of, of William F. Cody can play a crucial part in making the case for a deep and realistic exploration of Western American history in the nation and in the world at large. So what I will be doing is noting examples from the case study uh, presented by Cody's life, and I will hope that this field guide idea works as a way to point out those examples potential of those examples with, treated with vigor and enthusiasm uh, and recognized 
as matches with the most important themes and patterns and trends of Western history. So why a Western historian can and should bank on the likely prospect that using Cody as your case study in public communications will retain, recruit and retain audiences and reduce their defensiveness. So first a moment of uh, figuring out who's here. So um, before I explain why I wanted to know this, so who is here today out of intense personal interest in the history of Buffalo Bill Cody? And you should raise your hand. Okay. Uh, who is an academic historian, someone working at a, a college or university? That's significant. Um, who is a historian working in an institution that is not a college or university, a museum, a historical society, an archive, et cetera? Well, if we were to match off for football or something, we would probably have even teams there, but we're not going to do that. It's going to be quite the opposite of, of that. Um, who is a person who is very enthusiastic about history, but who never choose, chose to pursue a graduate degree in that field and whose day job supports the history habit? Wow. <laughs> wow, that's a good team. Who, and don't be shy if this happens to be the case, who is a person who is indifferent to history and who may even have hated it in high school, someone who might have been forced to memorize dates, for instance, which uh, doesn't go well as a pedagogical strategy, but who, who is, if this person then um, hates, hates history but was dragged here today by a relative or friend? <laughs> There's almost always a cat to a spouse. Well, okay, you can speak about that privately. I guess that's a message to discuss on your way home. Uh, or, uh, well, let's skip this one. I was going to ask if there was a person who moved here recently and who was just taunted by the thought, who is that guy named Cody and why is he all over this town? But no, let's not do that. Um, so the good news is if you were sitting in proximity from somebody, oh, good, more, more Kleenexes keep arriving. This is good. I might actually have the courage just to you blow my nose. It's a funeral home for <laughs> It is a little melancholy here, isn't it? A little. Um, okay. Uh, and actually, that's, uh, curiously, I will end on exactly that. Well, it's lucky I have two pieces now. So, okay. Uh, so, if you're sitting in proximity to somebody who raised his or her hand for a different category from your own, you can reassure each other that this will all come out okay. Old alliances will be refreshed and reconfirmed. And in just a few moments, new alliances will be formed and ready for action. So, the pleasure of my view at this moment, there are many beautiful views to be had in Wyoming at this museum, but to look into this room and to see the thriving state of research and writing and curiosity in Western American history, that is on display in front of me and you were a, a beautiful sight to see. The word beautiful is having kind of a tough time in national usage right now, but I won't go there. Okay, uh, now there is a trigger warning though that parts of this talk may approach the borders of that very territory called historiography, but nobody should despair over this Historiography, just a few little moments on the road ahead of us. There will be at least a few interludes when I will take a swerve towards academic terrain, but these swerves will be brief and no one will be injured. <laughs> so, for instance, an early part of the talk will involve me taking advantage of the fact that 2017 involves two anniversaries. One of the, uh, these anniversaries <laughs> is packed to the gills with historical resonance, and that is the one that brought you here, the 100th anniversary of Buffalo <coughs> Bill's death, and the other anniversary carries dramatically less weight, the 30th anniversary of the publication of the Legacy of Conquest, which does not have the name Cody in it. <laughs> um, so this, I will now have an awkward moment of blaming others for that, <laughs> which is a scholarly skill that every young scholar <laughs> must learn soon. A number of the books and articles that would have made it possible for the author of Legacy of Conquest to steer a better course had not been published, written, or even imagined in 1986. So there we are. That's who we might blame for this problem, is that they had not gotten out there. Some of them, I think, might still have been in high school or middle school. So <laughs> the authors didn't come through for me. Uh, but when you think about it, it is odd. I was, this is a book that was trying to put everything I could find to challenge the obituaries for the field of Western American history that were common in the academic scene. This may seem peculiar and improbable, and it was, but when I went for my job interviews in 1979, 
uh, as a Western American historian, I heard various people, at the interviewers from Harvard said, we're curious why you would go into this backwater of a field. <laughs> Oddly, I got the job. That, I guess, is a sign of something. Um, there's many comical stories about why that might have happened. But there I was trying to add energy to the field of Western American history, and I wanted to reach an audience between college, beyond colleges and universities, and I chose not to use the words Buffalo Bill Cody or Wild West in the book. As the familiar phrase goes, what was I thinking? Well, a friend of mine, Randy Olson, has done a great job. He's a science communicator, and he has helped us um, make our communications more efficient and give them more clarity by recommending that we use the format A, B, T, and, but, therefore. Okay. So assertions, countering those assertions, and then uh, resolution or synthesis. So this has the uh, misfortune of being so efficient that you can almost sit down and not give your speech after you've done this, but that's not going to happen here. So uh, here is my ABT. You'll notice the and, the but, and the therefore. The legacy of conquest did not even mention Buffalo Bill Cody, and that was probably because back in 1986, when I was finishing the book, I thought of Cody as a major supplier of misleading and romanticized views of Western history. I perhaps th even thought of him as the founding father of the problems of popular belief that I was trying to correct. <laughs> And therefore, I assumed that referring to Cody would evoke in most readers an intense flood of stereotype thinking about the West and defeat me before I even got started. <laughs> but avoiding, clear, uh, avoiding Cody was clearly an unwise move, adding up to a sacrifice originating in ignorance of a spectacular opportunity to communicate important understandings of Western history to a wider audience. Therefore, Having Jeremy ask me to give this speech has provided a very welcome opportunity to make a wiser choice and to recognize that Cody's story presents an unmatched opportunity to explore and celebrate several key perspectives on Western history that did not figure much of it all in the legacy of conquest, arising in part from the recognition that the changing historical interpretations of Buffalo Bill have turned out to be much more intriguing and thought-provoking than they were disillusioning and corrosive. So, uh, this in some ways, it, I felt this morning that many people were giving my speech, and I do want to say that when Paul Fee said that the person, the nader of Cody's uh, debunking and, and critical appraisal was Henry Nash Smith's book, uh, Virgin Land. Guess who wrote Henry Nash Smith a, a fan letter when I read the book? So, now we know who to blame. We'll blame Henry Nash Smith. That's a, that's a good idea. Um, so, okay, so here we are. Um, in making Buffalo Bill C Cody a major case study, that would have been very wise. I wish I could put that on public record in some way. I have, for years, I've been recommending that academic journals create a feature that could be added and be very popular. People would go there before they go to the book reviews or the articles. It would be called Errors Acknowledged. <laughs> or maybe with livelier wording, Confessions of Thick-Wittedness. <laughs> accompanied by the hope for redemption. <laughs> In fact, I don't really know why we would confine that to academic journals, given how <laughs> useful that, that would be. So this is my, uh, anybody who knows Anne Hyde at the Western Historical Quarterly, tell her I'm ready to go as the first entry, if they add that. So the um, context for this appeal to Cody centrality for making a case for a greater engagement of the public with history. This is the context, and it, this is from my university, but there's hundreds of universities and colleges that could show this. That um, downward turn there, it's steady on the number of graduates, uh, graduate enrollments in the, in, the dis, in the Department of History, but that slump there, that uh, top line, that's undergraduates. And it's starker and steeper in some places. Ours is looking bad. Um, so there is the context for why I, I'm really glad to be here making this pitch today. Because that's not a good thing. Lots of young people who want to major in history or go on in history, the chorus of relatives, fathers, mothers, grandparents, aunts, uncles, all, oh, don't major in history. You'll never get a job there. Do something else. And uh, OK. That's OK. And we have many people here who did that, who went into other professions and came out fine. Look at you're fine. Look at them. They're just fine. So, um, and yet, there is another context. The second part of this context 
is that we are living in a nation with a calamitous affliction of amnesia. So the time has certainly come to mobilize a united, happy, many of them youthful members team to address amnesia and obliviousness. So that's got to change, not just for the sake and health of history departments, which is not a uh, basis for much of an argument there, but because what his history departments offer is so much an undersupply. And to live with amnesia, when an individual gets amnesia, if you know somebody, you don't say, well, how great that must be, refreshing that must be, because every day is new, every minute is new. You just start every day and just a new beginning. Who are all these people? Uh, so you take them to a neurologist and a similar urgency is there when a society has that trouble. So no more factionalization, no more academic historians versus public historians versus um, enthusiasts or sometimes called buffs. No, reconcile and join forces, that's the, that's the pitch. So what I think is the key to this is uh, a sport called applied history. And many people are already doing this. Uh, and I am at a place where so much public engagement happens. And it, it's a wonderful thing to see what this institution has done in that vein. Most people, many of the people doing applied history don't use that term. They may just think of themselves as reaching a, a wider public. And indeed, applied history puts a little bit more of an edge on trying to think of how to be useful. That is to say, applied history at its core is bringing historical perspective to bear on current dilemmas. Our center's slogan down at the bottom there is, uh, Center American West, is turning hindsight into foresight. The fundamental questions asked in applied history, how did we get to our present situation? What options and alternatives did we pass up on the way here? And could we recapture some of those alternatives? How can we challenge ideas of inevitability and replace them with a sense of possibility, contingency, and choice? I should say, just to make it, um, everyone in the room is totally on board with this, that an applied historian always works with a recognition that any purposeful distortion of the past in order to arrive at a more palatable or more agreeable lesson for the present, any distortion of the past is off limits and any such distortion should be received with mockery. So there we are. Okay, now let's go to applied history in action. Well, here's, here's what will happen. Um, in applied history, if things go awry, the two bad outcomes with a public audience, and I think there's many people here who can testify this, the two things that can go wrong, one thing that you can do, scenario number one, you're an historian, you love history, you're talking to public audience, and you lose them because you bore them, because you trigger bad memories of old memorization exercises in high school, or whatever, that's bad. But worse is you lose them because you make them angry and defensive. And this is an image that I think well captures the way an audience can look to you when you have tripped and gone in the direction of making them defensive. So, this is me in Harney County, Oregon. Pete Simpson wrote a book that was incredibly helpful to me uh, for preparing for this trip. Harney County is the site of the Malheur National Wildlife uh, Refuge Arm Takeover in January of 2016. These are citizens of Harney County. The folklore, which I think is accurate, is that from January of 2016, when the Bundys and their followers came and uh, did their armed takeover, there had been nothing that passed for a civil, successful public discussion. There had been shouting matches, there had been police escorts of people out of the room and so on. So there I am. and. Look at my topic, for heaven's sake. There's my topic, the tension between democracy and conservation in the management of public lands. Well, <laughs> why not just go to South Carolina and speak on the Confederate flag? Why not just do that? So, uh, so there I am, and this is a good photograph because to take away its suspense, it went really well. And it was a civil evening, and it actually goes into folklore, I think is a good change. But at this moment, I haven't given a speech, and there's uh, the future is unknowable. It happens over and over and over again. We cannot see the future. So this, however, uh, giving the speech, 
I ended up telling a friend, Ian Frazier, who works for the New Yorker, about this amazing adventure. And so giving the speech to give away the ending that it turns out fine, all's well that ends well, or at least ends up in the New Yorker. So there I am. This is a, a case you're not getting at. That is actually a caricature of me. Um, <laughs> my husband says that he would not pick me out of a police lineup with that image, but there it is. So here is the watchtower that snipers had been posted at the top of that. That's me. Um, once it had been demilitarized. We actually were there, I think, a day or two after they finally opened the, the uh, refuge after a long period of cleanup and getting things back in order. The, the uh, people weren't working there yet, but we can go on to the site there. So this, uh, well, this is a, the concealed carry purse area at, a, at the uh, Pete French, this is the Pete French roundhouse thing. So. There we are, and that is my backpack, which I stuck with. I did not, I bought a very nice little wallet, but I did not buy a, uh, but then I noticed coming in here that you do have the signs here about leave your firearms at the, at the desk, so. So um, anyway, so there we are. So now to go back to this, here's what I think now, that the subject, public lands, that was fine, but what I have been thinking over the last few weeks is that I should have had the sense to choose the topic of Buffalo Bill Cody. Because Harney County, Oregon is a place where ranching is a powerful cultural force. The cowboy hats are omnipresent there, the multiple generation ranch families. So the Cody, Cody stories and enactments and exhibitions are all hovering in the air in lots of ways about the meaning of what it is to be a, a rancher. Although I don't, we have to be there at calving season. I don't remember anything in the Wild West about having to get up in the middle of the night about calving season. That seems to have been left out of the romance of ranching. Um, although it is something that makes ranchers really impressive and people to be around because they are so uh, persistent and determined. So this is an area where strong feelings about the Western heritage are in play wherever you go. This is a Western area that seems very remote from national and international scenes, but it is in fact actually closely tied to the changes in national and international pictures. So it probably would have been a smart move to talk about Buffalo Bill Cody. I thought the Bundys, uh, my mythic memory of this recent event was that the Bundys and their supporters always wore cowboy hats. And I have been puzzled by that because in Harney County, it's really cold in the winter and how they protected their ears. Did they have, did the Bundys come with earmuffs under the, just a puzzle to me. But you can see actually there's quite a range of cowboy hats among the occupiers at the refuge. And thinking about hats, well actually I just want one quick little, before I get deeply into the hat issue here, um, could you listen to this statement and decide if you agree or disagree or are just puzzled by it? Our understanding of the history and consequences of the armed takeover at the Malheur National Wild Ref Wildlife Refuge in Harney County would improve if we stepped aside from the recent controversies and shifted over to thinking about Buffalo Bill and his heritage. So who, uh, the first vote would be, oh yeah, I can see that that would be a way to go to that county and bring in a better framework of thought. How many would say, yeah, that would be a good move to shift to Buffalo Bill Cody? It's not really sweeping the electorate here. So, although Jeremy is voting for three or four back there, but okay. Um, how many would go for, oh, don't do that. The Cody story gets complicated enough and don't bring the poor man into that. How many would be sort of a, just stay away from it? So, a few, well, that's interesting. That's totally interesting, Steve. Yeah, we got, Steve, how many, I would just say, that's the oddest statement I've ever heard a speaker make, really. That's just a very puzzling remark. So, okay, that was it. That carries the election. Okay, so now to try, I'll try to explain a little bit more why I think it's the case. So here, uh, here are these people wearing different hats. Here is your governor trying to teach my governor how to wear a cowboy hat. <laughs> your governor does not seem to think it's going well or, or seems to think it's a very, I guess speaking of humor and the use of humor, that's not so good. Uh, there is a cowboy hat. No, no, we're not gonna do that right now, no. So, uh, and then this is a pretty well-worn hat, but here are all these presidents with cowboy hats. And presidents, it's not, I don't think it's in the Constitution, but it couldn't have been because there weren't cowboy hats at the time of the Constitution, that's historic. But uh, presidents must wear cowboy hats at some point, that is just required. And it is something to think of, why? 
here are other perfectly good hats. But for whatever reason, there is no understanding that as a president, at some point, you will have to, I mean, that wouldn't be the worst outreach to rural America to, to wear a seed cap and know you weren't wearing a baseball cap, but you were wearing a seed cap. I mean, they're just things that you could do with a, with a hat. But for whatever reason, it's the cowboy hat. And if you asked yourself, why, why does the cowboy hat carry such power? Why is that so persistent in our cultural world? The part of the answer has to be Buffalo Bill Cody. If you try to answer that question and you don't get him and riding around the arena, that did he wear a hurricane strap or did he? Well, how, anyway, but somehow did his hat ever blow off? Oh, we don't know. We don't need to know. That would be a debunking question if we asked that. So let's not ask that. So I think there is a first demonstration. If you want to think about the mystique of ranching and why cowboy hats are so politically um, omnipresent and so on, I think you have to go to Cody. So we'll start there. Now I want to talk for a second, another historiographic moment, how I was rescued from ig ignorance and indifference. First teaching at the Buffalo Bill Historical Center very soon after Legacy came out, Lillian Turner, who organized that, never said to me, we are doing this to uplift you and redeem you from error, but it worked. Um, I mean, Paul Fees, Peter Hazrick, and then working with Richard White on the book that's been, uh, this is the treatment program that I got, and the, here's Richard White who wrote the book that Paul Fees was quoting and referring to. I wrote an ar article that accompanied it, but what knocked me over in reading Richard's article, first what P uh, Paul already quoted, that we should take Buffalo Bill's thinking as seriously as we take Frederick Jackson Turner, the noted uh, frontier historian, but when he did this thing, when he took the Dakota stage and he took the settler's cabin and Richard White pointed out that this is a wondrous inversion. These very scenes where Buffalo Bill rescues people, a wondrous inversion of who invaded whom, who went into whose turf. The notion that everything there is uh, white folks who Indian people have just inexplicably attacked just out of their fundamental character of their desire to attack white people, as if, in fact, Indians had gone to uh, the English countryside and attacked <laughs> cottages there. It's sort of the inverted conquest notion of who is the innocent and who is the invader. When I read that in Richard's essay, which I got to see ahead of time because we were uh, before it was published, I thought, that Cody, that's pretty interesting would do that. So various conversions. I want to say this cabin is so funny as it evolves over time. I was maybe 20 years ago, an historian John Wiener took me to Disneyland so we could go to Frontierland and I could comment on that so he could write an article about that. So we had a most interesting tour of uh, Frontierland at Disneyland probably 25 years ago. Yeah, that would be right. So we were on the uh, boat ride where you go by the settler's cabin, which is clearly a reference back to this at Frontierland, as the guide on our boat went by the settler's cabin. The settler's cabin at Disneyland at that time was always in flames. Uh, so she said, I guess, I mean, I've been on there before, and, and the settler's cabin had been attacked by Indians, and that was why it was in flames. This time, the woman, as we go by, the woman says, oh, the settler's cabin is in flames because the settler was environmentally careless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that, begins to make sense. I see now why the settler had, had trouble. But what a wonderful um, thing to follow, that cabin and how it persists and changes and, it's, and gets put to different meetings. Then, one more historiographic stop and then we won't be doing too much more of that. This is my friend Michael Kamen, who passed away a year or two ago. He wrote a book called People of Paradox. It's a really helpful book. Um, it did me a world of good because in reading that book in the past and then after his death, going back to it and thinking about it. Um, here is the definition, the ne definition of paradox, something that's made up of two opposite things, the two things seem opposite, the one thing can't make, can't be true, but in fact the two things coexist and both, uh, even though it says, the statement says opposite, two opposite things, but still can be true. This beautiful quotation from Oliver Wendell Holmes, there's nothing like a paradox to take the scum off your mind, and in case anyone wasn't sure what scum was, there's a, that is when you can see that that's something you would not want to have on your mind. <laughs> so, uh, so that is the angle here. Uh, Wallace Stegner said, the West is the native home of hope. 
I think we could rewrite that with Mr. Stegner probably approving for a little bit more accuracy. The West, from time to time, is the native home of hope, but the West is very persistently the native home of paradox. And the only problem with that statement is that it could be said with equal accuracy about any place on the planet occupied by human beings, but it is still fair to say that paradox operates with particular punch and force in the habitat of the American West. So back to Cody. The reason to seize on, the, on Cody for the cause of applied history, Cody has, if you want to take the biggest issues of Western American history to a wider audience, you should choose Cody because he has astounding and almost unparalleled durability in name recognition. And I know that's a little bit questionable with young people, but so far the kids working in my office, they may not know much about him, but they recognize that that is a name, um, which I give poor, 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 poor uh, uh, Jack. He's wouldn't even try with, I forgot, what is his, what is he called, I can't remember what he's called, his, what is his first name? His first name is not uh, Buffalo, his first name, the yeah. Captain, yeah. Captain, oh, that tells you how much, it was a great talk and now I forgot his first name, <laughs> which is not his first name, but when you have, I think, I'm, I'm sure it would be all right with me to say that uh, Jim Watt told me that his kids always thought his first name was um, controversial, the controversial James Watt, so, <laughs> so that will happen, our names can just move around. For so okay, so he has astounding durability in name recognition. It's it's a little frightening to think what would Buffalo Bill have achieved if he had had access to social media. He had tweeted, but I don't know. I'm not sure there would have been that. He, in the absence of that mechanism, he did everything that most of us would never know how to do. How do you go viral? For a sake, none of us knows how to do that. Well, he had that down before the concept actually made any. Um, direct material sense. So historians are spared a good share of the hard work of coaxing Indians to pay attention. And I would say that in Harney County, a talk on, on Buffalo Bill Cody, what a lot of people would say, oh, he always seemed like an interesting fellow. Let's go hear that. And they wouldn't necessarily say, let's go and choose where we sit in the room carefully so we're sitting, so we will not be around any of these neighbors who feel very differently about Cody than we do. I think it would be a depolarizing issue in a place like Harney County and would bring in people in a different, different mood. Um, second, his big claims to historical significance are entirely supportable. His life covers nearly every theme of significance in the revitalized Western history, what was called for a time the new Western history, but is now the late middle-aged Western history. Um, and again, the point I made earlier, the third point, historians have handled Cody's story with a I'm not going to say unique, but a distinctive stance and tone. They have deepened their research and arrived at better understandings of his life, and in some ways they have then reached what you might call kinder understandings of his life, or just at least more open-ended and reflective, rather than simply racking up a more exhaustive list of his sins and flaws. And that stance and tone is much more likely to be well-received by public audiences that might otherwise be porcupine-like. So Cody's life is a parable of the highest order and as a historical case study, I don't really know how he would match them, um, match him up with anybody else. So here is the theme for the day, a little bit of a recording. There is nothing like the serious consideration of the history of Buffalo Bill for taking the scum off the mine. <laughs> Here's the method. This is a tedious slide and um, our treasured friend Richard White has expressed contempt for my putting these, when I, whenever he sees me put that many words on the slide, I um, get a really grim look. <laughs> Porcupine could not give such a look as he gives on that. But anyway, here it is, just to tell you, what I think we can do is take advantage of the fact, what I've already said, that the name Buffalo Bill Code um, is widely recognized and brings audience attention. Then what you do in the methods, you select a story from Cody's life that connects directly to important themes in Western American history and <laughs> in that process unsettles conventional wisdom, but may sometimes end up validating conventional wisdom, that's okay too. Then, you, with your Cody story in play, you take a story about somebody else, another Western figure, probably much less uh, notable, or maybe sometimes almost as notable, and you juxtapose those two stories. Then, you engage your audience, and it really, it could be, I, I didn't put a dinner party, but it could certainly be that, in reflecting on ideas about the Western past that are brought into play by the two stories. So let's try it. Okay. Um, does anyone here, and don't say it so we don't give it away too fast here, did, does anyone remember 
what the Virginian did after he uh, shifted away from the cattle business. You could raise your hand if you remember that. So there would be four or five people. The Virginian, I'm a little bit in his home territory here. He is a fictional character, but he walks the land. Uh, I have been amazed at how few Wyoming people remember this second career, midlife change. So um, here we go. And I guess we want to spend a moment in puzzlement over why this is so universally forgotten. I don't think it's part of uh, public school education. I don't think Wyoming children are taught to forget this. or Because in fact, one of the great ways to get students to pay attention is to tell them not to do something. And that's really good. So, so if they did that, everyone would know this. OK, here we go. Um, a few lines at the end of the book. So uh, Worcester, Orlin Worcester, the author, did not think much of the rustlers and the small ranchers, the thieves, he calls them. When the thieves prevailed at length, as they did, forcing cattle owners to leave the country or be ruined, the Virginian had forestalled this crash because the railroad came and built a branch to that land of the Virginians where the coal was. By that time, he was an important man with a strong grip on many various enterprises. So the Virginian went into the coal business. That's interesting. So it is a fandom and forgotten line. And I think it is just waiting to be juxtaposed to Cody's mid-career shift. He didn't give up the other one, but to go into irrigation development, reclamation, the infrastructure of water. The moral of the story is, I'm sure there's many things you can do if you put those two things together, but in my opinion, those two stories put together rattle conventional thinking about the Western myth and the people most associated with the Western myth. So, of course, the Virginian is a fictional character. Uh, yes and no. I mean, he's, he certainly lives a life. He shapes people's behavior. He um, is a real operator in the world in some ways. So the punchline seems to me to be that mythic heroes were often very receptive to making money. And their skills sometimes made, um, attempted to make an effective transfer from one arena to the other, but didn't necessarily pull it, up, pull it off. In the Virginia's case, it did. In other words, mythic figures whether we've successfully classified them as real life or fictional, they won't stay put. They have a peculiar way that might be disillusioning to some of continuing to be entrepreneurial and trying to make a living. So if you pair those two stories, you, you've got somewhere, you move somewhere in a way that I think is productive for thinking better about the West. So here we go. This is, this fellow is everywhere. I love this guy because he's, he's uh, falling over, but wee, he's so happy. He's just a, a joyful person who's just about to land hard, and he could, just couldn't be happier. Um, and he's here. I've seen him in this building. So hi. <laughs> I don't really have a name. I guess there wasn't any way to make him a girl, because he can't wear a skirt if he's in that particular, well, who knows? So let's not go there. So, um, so OK. So uh, we are going into tricky terrain, because I think it's really important to give this a try. So applied history to the rescue, the value of Buffalo Bill studies, and getting truth back on the trail in 2017. I believe that appraising Cody responsibly and in public forums helps, could help Americans get a grip on the whole complicated world of assessing accuracy and falsity. It won't be news to anyone here that we are starting in prickly and nervous terrain with this topic. But 2017 is a tough time for the very idea of truth, whether we're thinking of the terms alternative facts, fake news, or confirmation bias, that we hear something, it matches what we already believe, we believe it all the more. Americans living in what are sometimes called bubbles, that can't be the right phrase, because bubbles are very fragile, so if we lived in bubbles, they'd be popping all the time. Oh, look who's here, we'd be finding each other, it'd be nice. But <laughs> bubbles, much more rigid, um, very rigid bubbles. So all of those problems are uh, underway, every person Every individual, every citizen seems empowered to choose his or her own definition of truth and reality and use that definition to bash and dismiss any other definitions embraced by those that that person would consider ignorant and misguided. So we are in trouble. Western historians should be at the center of the problem solving team taking on that societal dilemma. And I will say, <laughs> I can testify to that because we have made a lot of progress since 1987 when the book Legacy of Conquest came out. Legacy came out um, with a much simpler idea of how to 
perform this maneuver. In 1987, it was obviously my conviction that many people harbored inaccurate thoughts about Western history, and the thing to do was to debunk those mistaken thoughts and set people free of their errors. So that, I think, was maybe a little bit overstated, but that was pretty much my stance writing Legacy. Debunking, it turns out, is a great way to generate resentment and defensiveness. And if that was my goal, mission accomplished. Uh, so to deepen, if you want to deepen and enhance the loyalty and devotion of the misguided to their inaccurate beliefs, I can, my previous self could show you how to do it. Is disillusioning people an accomplishment, an achievement to be proud of? My perspective on this changed uh, probably 20 or more years ago in Santa Fe. I had a group of international scholars, and I had probably very close to when Legacy came out. I had told them the uh, reality of Western American history. I had, had uh, spoken up every now and then of Karl May, the German writer who never went to the West at the time that he wrote his books, but wrote romantic versions of the West. So we were having a conversation, and a young woman from Poland, who had grown up in Poland before the end of the Cold War under Soviet domination. So very near the end of our week together, this young woman suddenly decided to speak. She said, I was going to stay silent, but now I want to speak. I will tell you, Professor Miller, that the first book, books my father read to me in Poland, in tough times, were Karl May books. As soon as I could read for myself, the first books I read were Karl May books. When I was seven, I saw my first Karl May movie, and she said, she's getting a little bit carried away at this point, she said, and even though, even though old Shatterhand was played by a fat Frenchman, I loved him still. So, you know, <laughs> powerful feelings there. Um, and she had been, the day before she'd been to Acoma Pueblo, and she had learned the word Kiva, the sacred site. And so she said, and so Professor Limerick, I will just say this to you. You may tell me what you like about the real West, but I will tell you, that Karl May is the Kiva in my soul. So I thought, this might be time to recalculate course here. <laughs> um, so a far better route, I mean, I have no idea why it is so widespread, the notion that fact-checking will change minds. That's a very electric form of communication, I tell you. I just, my, uh, oh, my blood pressure, I don't have high blood pressure, but when people start fact-checking, you can't help but get very excited and exhilarated. Well, anyway, what a notion. Uh, storytelling, though. Storytelling is a fine, fine alternative and a much better method, and this is what we're going to be able to do with our Cody Studies um, initiative. In Cody Studies, anyone who is working hard at this and taking it seriously recognizes that myth may arise in a kind of remote relationship to fact, but myth often shapes or even governs actual behavior and conduct. And once that happens, good luck with finally and fully distinguishing myth from reality. Beliefs that have a remote connection to reality and accuracy in their content still alter people's decisions and actions, and thus myth becomes inextricably intertwined with reality, and that just has to be dealt with. The whole ambiance of Cody's Wild West is a dance of fact and fiction, reality and imagination, truth and falsehood. People who wrestle with the complicated arrangements of truth and fiction and falsehood uh, and, and accuracy in the life of Buffalo Bill Cody will be trained and positioned, are trained and positioned to benefit their fellow citizens. Working responsibly with Cody's history requires skills of weighing evidence, appraising accuracy, and acknowledging the power of perception and subjectivity in determining what people believe to be true. These folks who have done this work have moved far beyond simple assertions of fact and truth, but they have not thereby mocked or dismissed the human need for clarity and trust and for some shared capacity to distinguish nonsense from substance. So just because you have to think hard when you navigate in the terrain of Cody, that does not mean that you must abandon respect for accuracy in fact. So Cody and applied history, the prescription. The historical studies of the Wild West give us our footing in a way that offers us direct, a direct remedy to our current national trouble with truth. We can study the Wild West, and in that process, we surrender any arrogant claim to having identified reality for all time and for all purposes, and we are surrendering simple ca categorization of truth and fiction while we embrace the blessed virtue of humility. So in a more sharp-edged moment, and, uh, I wrote a limerick quite a few years ago about this problem. 
I did not know how much it would be a problem. So here is a more sharp edge ver version. A swirl of diverse points of view mushes history into a stew. Facts now a fiction, earning much malediction, leaving liars with nothing to do. Well, that's sharp edge. But I do think that historians could play a big role in getting us out of this muddle. Now, I've had what others have had a too good a time up here, so I'm just going to move along very fast here that I, can, I think the Buffalo Bill studies would be extremely helpful in taking on the urban-rural divide that has been so much a subject of concern and discussion in our time. I think it uh, does a great, gives us a great opportunity to inject curiosity, deeper understanding into the feelings about government, the anti-government fray of our time. We can, in fact, find fascination in the entrancing and instructive stories of federal bureaucrats employed by the Department of the Interior. We're going to have some time to do that, but we're not going to do that right now. We can certainly do it. I'm here for, through the whole conference. I'll be happy to spend time on this, but when Cody enters the wild wor world of irrigation, that's an amazing opportunity to glimpse the power of the federal government at work. Uh, a document unknown to humanity is as unknown to the world as the Wild West was comparably known to the world. Frederick Newell who was a little bit of a nemesis to Cody, the first director of the uh, Office of uh, excuse me, or the Reclamation Service. Frederick Newell, in his 11th annual report, has what I have never seen in a federal document from any regime anywhere. It's a section where Newell lists the things that people in the Reclamation Service, including himself, believed when they started the Reclamation Service that turned out not to be true. One of the, it seems not a world apart from what Cody himself said, that, that irrigation costs a lot more than you realize and so on. That section in Newell's report is called Fallacies Entertained and it is an official report of the federal government. So that put, put Cody's story together with Newell and you have something really important to think about and there is no time permitting. So bye, there they go, goodbye. Oh, so funny, okay. oh, that's so good, that's fine, oh no. We can go back, anybody could say, was there anything really great that you didn't talk about? And well, yes, there were, and then we'll go back to those. But um, okay, oh, we can't do that either. So then we have, so, oh, we can't do that, oh my goodness. Oh, there they are, oh, no, this, is, this is too funny. This is a, a question about how to, place Cody in the progressive era. It's very easy to place him in the Gilded Age. Uh, Louis Warren helped me with this, and certainly you can think of his projects as kind of the search for order of the progressive era. But this is my dream that, I don't know why we couldn't do this, a reenactment. The Dakota stage often had a dignitary or two in it, so the Dakota stage comes into the arena, races around, the Indians attack, Cody rescues it. What I would like to have, uh, and often the mayor steps out, or the, the uh, chairman of the, of the County commissioners or something like that. So I want those two guys to come out. I want the uh, Gifford Pinchot and Theodore Roosevelt riding in the Dakota stage. They're chased around and then they rescued by Cody and then they get out of the stage and they have to talk about how their approach to domesticating the West matches and doesn't match. So, okay, uh, there we are. Um, did go to this one, so taken on. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Louis, for helping with that. But we can come back to that. Uh, this one we do have to take a second on because she's so excellent. Ma Whitaker, who was a wonderful woman. I guess she was, she seems to have been wonderful. She was the woman, I was called the matron, is that the name, the matron? And she was at the camp, uh, very diverse groups of people, and boy, do we need her in 2017, or her descendants. There's been a wonderful papers presented on tra tracing descendants of some of these figures. We need Ma Whitaker's people back in play here because she <laughs> lived in the camp and she brought, um, some kind of clarity and harmony into all those diverse encounters. Uh, okay, now we're actually at the conclusion. So this is an interesting question to me that back in my Legacy of Conquest days, I certainly thought that Buffalo Bill Cody was one of the reasons that Western violence and death had gotten trivial, trivialized. But how could that have been done? The sorrows, the tragedies, the brutality, the injuries of Western American history somehow or other got transfigured into fun, escapism, entertainment. And I, uh, that question to me is a uh, place to stop and ponder. How could, it, if, how could I have held Cody responsible for that, that reconfiguring and trivializing when he was a man so heavily burdened with sorrow and, so, and hit so hard by frailty and mortality? This was one classic case of a, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Uh, the loss of two children in childhood, the loss of uh, one daughter as a young, young adult, the 
sufferings of his father in his last last years, um, unhappy marriage, people he had taken to England, sometimes um, from white people, Indian people, getting sick when they were far from home and or dying overseas. So many encounters with mortality. And then, uh, I suppose, okay, so mortality. So is this one route to a different kind of mortality to have so many reenactors? I don't think that would be much of a consolation to most of us. I don't know if that's there or not. But this is really where the intensity of this story to me is, um, uh, makes me glad I have Phoenix here. So here is the young Cody and here is the old Cody and that journey from youth to mortality is really always a stunning part of human experience. But maybe because of this man's vitality, maybe even greater to think there's the older couple, very old couple, after many, many sorrows. Um, older, the hat becomes more important with hair loss, I guess that's more significant. But <laughs> the, to look at that and to think Cody will be passing away not too long after that. Those children will grow into adults. Those children will become elders themselves. Those children will, will pass away the extraordinary vitality aspect of this, the amazing presence and the impossibility. I mean, I, I have often said to students, the hardest part with history is really believing that the people of the past were fully alive. I, I tell this little story about a, a little boy who was taken to the Supreme Court to see the court sitting and he was watching and then uh, a fly came into the chamber and flew around and landed on the head of one of the justices and then, Justice brushed it off. The little boy grabbed his father's arm and said, did you see that? Did you see that? One of them's alive. <laughs> so um, figuring that out with the people of the past, that's a challenge. Um, but this, do we have to say, was that guy really present? Was he really fully, vitally involved? No, in fact, we know for a fact that he was fully present. Um, and with that, I conclude with the University of Colorado having the best mascot imaginable and it's hard for me to believe that we would have that mascot that something about that and having the handlers run out that our football games always begin with a not quite a reenactment of the wild west wouldn't be that but it is so beautiful and so inspiring to see that bison run around the field so i put this bison out here i don't mind using it for now we have a slightly better football team i don't mind having the poor bison associated with sometimes it was very bad to have that bison associated with the team that did so poorly but it's getting better. But what I dream of is persuading the University of Colorado franchisers or whoever they are to let us use that bison for occasions when united teams of historians, academic historians, people working in museums and archives and historical societies, uh, people who are supporting their history have it with outside jobs, uh, school children who've done history day projects and are very excited. So Ralphie leads us out into the field of public engagement of applied history and somewhere very prominent in that picture, uh, probably on the scoreboard, might as well put it on the scoreboard if we're doing it there, there is an image of Buffalo Bill Cody. Thank you. Yes, yes, Patty is around for days, and uh, she will take questions, so you're, you're free to, she's, as you can see, she's very approachable, and ask her your questions. So 